All right, you guys ready? Yeah. Let's do it. You guys got notes? I, I just scrammed to the last minute to get these notes to you, so I'm sorry that they're small and just plain. Usually I like to put some artwork in there, but I'll try to make a manual pretty soon here. Um, but I wanted to give you those verses at least. So there's some notes on here, just my notes that I preach from. So if it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. I just gave you that for the verses. But um, I mean, this has been a, a really fun study for me. I've been studying it for the past year. And um, in 2012, I was uh, at Harvest Rock and I was at a conference. And to be honest with you, um, I was bored. And uh, I didn't even have to go to the bathroom, but I went. I was just walking around, decided I better I could use the bathroom. And so it was during a, um, one of the sessions, and uh, the Holy Spirit hit me in the bathroom, and I'm holding on to the, uh, the stall wall because I'm like, I do not want to go down in the bathroom. That is gross, God. Like, not now. You know, I'm holding on for dear life, and I'm like... And so in that moment, uh, he speaks to me. He said, I want you to start a house of prayer. And I wrote it down, but uh, I just said, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> it was just not where I was and uh, just a whole different vibe and set of beliefs that I was just not there. And um, so that's been sitting since 2012. And um, I don't know what happened. Um, I guess just God's been speaking to me over the years, but just really seeing that as a necessity in our day and age. And so um, in our season, you know, uh, during COVID, there was a prophetic word going around and even a book um, by Jeremy Riddle called The Reset. But that prophetic word about resetting went around. And a lot of it had to do with purifying the church. And if you, you guys know that word revival, meaning bringing something back to life that was alive and, was, and now is dead. And so all of that is God restoring something in the church. And uh, we want to just be a part of that. Because if you want your life to be successful, from what I've heard, is that you find out what God's doing in your lifetime and you just pour yourself into it. And so God is doing this, and it's not over. It's just because we see things kind of going back to normal. It uh, doesn't mean that God still doesn't want to finish what he started, right? And so um, what I feel like that has to do with is the purifying the expression of worship. And, you know, when you approach something like that, you don't compare yourself to the church next door, right? you compare yourself to the original model in the book of Acts. And so um, so it led me to this thing about the tabernacle of David because it's not a secret. Um, God said in the last days, when I restore Israel, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David. And so what is the tabernacle of David? Well, we'll get started with just um, how this came about. Um, the context in the early church there was a debate whether the Gentiles um, could get saved or not. Or should they become Jews first and then get saved? And there was a big debate going on. And so James, uh, a lot of people say it was the brother of Jesus. Some people say it was the cousin of Jesus. Um, and his, his real name was Jacob. And so uh, King James put his, his name in, in the Bible, changed it from Jacob to James. But his, his real name is Jacob. And so he was a, an elder in the church in the book of Acts. And so he speaks up and he quotes an Old Testament prophecy. And so in Acts 15, 16 through 17, this is the Passion Translation, he, he quotes, After these things I will return to you and raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen into ruin. I will restore and rebuild what David experienced. So all of human humanity will be able to encounter the Lord, including the Gentiles whom I have called to be my very own, says the Lord. And so you can see 
why he quoted that Old Testament prophecy was because of the Gentiles. He's saying no one's going to keep them from coming in. In fact, it was way back when God had this idea to use Israel to be a beacon of light to the other nations, right? He was going to bless Israel, use them, and he did with Solomon. We see that happening with Solomon. Kings and queens from other nations coming to see the wisdom that he had, right? And that was God's plan, that he would use the nation of Israel um, to really bless everyone else. And so when they're having this debate, he quotes this old... Uh, Testament prophecy. And so, um, this prophecy, why this prophecy? We're going to get into the original text, which is Amos 9.11. But, you know, sometimes when we think about, um, in like in the book of Acts, or even in other epistles, when a New Testament writer quotes an Old Testament verse that's amazing i always look into that and sometimes i'm like how did you even get that you know i I don't even see the correlation how would you even think of that but it's by the holy spirit right it's by the holy spirit and so he basically brings this verse up to say that this i mean it's 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 implied that this verse has to do with their day right this verse, now we can say, is applied to their situation. Okay? And so, when it, there's three things there. When I restore Israel, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David, and then the Gentiles are going to be able to come in and encounter the Lord, right? And so, there's three things there. We think of one thing being fulfilled, but I want to suggest that if he's using that prophetic word, he is declaring that in that season, those three things are being restored. Because those three things go together when God's restoring Israel. Okay? So this was the time of restoration also of Israel. And the time to restore what God calls the tabernacle of David. And you may be thinking, well, Israel isn't really restored. It, th- there is a kingdom alive and well kingdom of zion alive and well all of the prophecies and all the promises to the jews have been restored they just don't know it yet does that make sense it's not going to look like a physical kingdom anymore okay so it has been restored and there's steps to this but eventually paul says that the our salvation is going to lead the jews to jealousy right holy jealousy and they're going to come too okay so that's part of the plan But it's amazing that in that time, we're seeing, oh, this is the restoration that God had been promising, which is really exciting, okay? Um, Let's see. An important part of this prophecy mentions something that happened a long time ago, a system of worship that was going on 24-7, commissioned by King David. So the original text is Amos 9.11, and it basically says the same thing. In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David. Booth just means tabernacle. It also means tent. All the same thing. Okay. And wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. So that's exciting. So why, what is it, and why is it so important? Next page, it's on the back. So now if, if you kind of go into uh, the Old Testament, it wasn't just Amos that prophesied about the tabernacle of David. Other kings were in on this. Okay, and I'm just going to give you two uh, examples. One of those was Josiah. Josiah who restored and reformed worship in Israel. In Second Chronicles 35.15 it says, The singers, the sons of Asaph, were also at their stations according to the command of David. Isn't that cool? Asaph, Haman, and Jeduthun, the king's seer, and the gatekeepers at each gate did not have to depart from their service because the Levites, their brethren, prepared for them. So the Levites were the, um, the Mosaic covenant priests, right? 
the Levites, though they were according to the law of Moses, they were put in place. But they also took care of those that were put in place for the tabernacle of David, which is neat how they were working together. But Josiah somehow, um, I don't know if it got wind or if it was written down in the history books or whatever, but he restored what David started, which was not necessarily in the Mosaic law, right? So it must have been written down somewhere else, but started with, uh, uh, complete what David started. Also, another one was Nehemiah. Nehemiah 12, 24, the heads of the Levites were Hash, Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Kedmiel, with their brothers opposite them to praise and give thanks as prescribed by David, the man of God, division corresponding to division. Isn't that neat? So there's other kings that put this into place as well. Okay? And I would suggest that the book of Acts is the story of restoring the tabernacle of David. Anytime you see T-O-D, that's the tabernacle of David. The book of Acts is a, book, uh, is a story of restoring the tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of David was not under the law, but an idea of a lover of God. An idea of a lover of God. Okay, The Mosaic Law and the tabernacle of Moses was a prescribed way of worship with lots of rules and regulations. You can go through Leviticus. It tells exactly what you need to do for a, a sacrifice, an offering, or anything to be pleasing to the Lord, right? There's lots and lots of particulars, okay? So David still honored the Mosaic Law, of course, in that day and age, but added something to it that was not prescribed. And this is important to God. This seemed really important to God if he mentioned rebuilding it when he restores Israel. So there was something that, it's important that it wasn't prescribed by the law. It was David's idea. He went above and beyond something that was in his own heart to minister to the Lord, to please the Lord. This is something that's so important to God because it touched his heart more than anything else. You know when you get a card a birthday card, anniversary card, or something like that, and it has the pre-written uh, things that Hallmark writes on there, right? The printed um, saying, message. Well, you kind of read that, but you really want to read what the person wrote themselves, right? And this was kind of like the Tabernacle of David. Like God, he had these set things which they had to do to be holy. It wasn't, it, it wasn't just like God was like, oh, this is what I like, so do what I say. No, these were things that kept them from living in sin, that kept them holy and clean, and all these regulations uh, helped them come to a place where they could actually have a relationship with God, come into His presence without getting burnt up, right? And so that was prescribed. Well, it touched God's heart so much that David wanted to go above and beyond. It just touched him so much that David wasn't just doing the Mosaic Law, but he's like, I have an idea. Let's go 24-7. Let's give thanks to God continually. Let's just bless his socks off. I mean, imagine, you know, just as a person, if a friend did that for you, you know? I mean, you expect a card for your birthday, but like over the top. This is how God felt. He felt so loved by David because David just went over the top, right? And it's always been God's desire that he doesn't have robots, but he has true lovers, people that want to be with him, not forced to be with him, you know? It's kind of like if, you know, I took my wife out on a date and I said, I was reading this book, and to be a good husband, I must take you out on spontaneous dates, put my arm around your shoulder. When we're walking, I hold your hand. And at the end of the night, I'm going to give you a kiss because that's the, the responsible duty of a husband. I mean, who wants that? What wife wants that? What wife is going to be like, oh, yes, I feel so romantic right now, you know? I mean, just doing it out of duty? And, you know, a book you read and now you think, you know, this is something I have to do because I made a vow? You know, like, that's, that would be a terrible date, right? 
And so God doesn't want that. God doesn't want people to say, well, I must, I should, I have to do these things. I have to love you with all my heart, soul, and strength. Right? I mean, the whole point of the Mosaic Law was to point them in the right direction and have their heart be into it, not just like, I must do this, I must do that. Poor God, you know, he just gets, it's so sad sometimes how we treat him, right? Okay. Okay. So, that's why it was so important and so special to God because someone did it out of their over, the overflow of their love for Him. I mean, David just wanted to be in His presence. That was his one desire. Psalm 27.4. His one desire. Imagine that. If you had a, a spouse, a friend... Uh, that was just like, I just want to spend time with you. That's all I want to do. Right? Wouldn't that be, make you feel special? And that's, that's how David ministered to God. He made God feel special. I mean, he, he, didn't, he was a king. He had all kinds of things. He probably had horses, chariots, dogs, donkeys. He had, and, and his number one hobby and desire was, I just want to be in your presence. And that's why the tabernacle of David is so important. And that's why God wants to restore not the place, not the formula, the heart of that. Okay? So, if the tabernacle of David is so important, what is it? What is it? Well, before we get into the physical aspects of the tabernacle of David, allow me to emphasize some key points from what we already know. Okay? What do we know? Well, the tabernacle of David was not required by God. Okay? It was not required by God. It was not something that atoned for your sins. Right? It did not atone for your sins. It didn't offer forgiveness or acceptance. Okay? It was not even God's idea. It wasn't even God's idea. Okay? And that really has to do with becoming children of God, coming out of slavery in our mentalities, becoming children of God. Slavery is you do what you're told out of fear of punishment. That's what slavery is, a a slavery mentality. Right? But a child of God now is able to be creative. Why? They're not scared to fail or get punished for doing the wrong thing. When you have a slave mentality, you end up being in a place where you're like, I have these decisions. I don't know what to do. God, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. I don't want to mess this up. Why? Why can't we be children of God and say, you know what? God's going to bless me no matter what. I'm just going to go for it. If he's not giving me direction, that means I get to make a decision. And I want to make a decision that's because I just, my goal is just to bless him. Make a decision that's because I just, and David did that. He said, you know what I'm going to do? Because I want to be in his presence so much. We're, we're doing this thing 24-7. So even if I can't sleep at night, 3 in the morning, I have a place to go where the presence is there and worship's going on. <laughs> okay? It wasn't even God's idea. And children of God have the liberty to be creative. It's not a sin if you don't do it. What's so amazing about freedom is now if you you do it, you're doing it out of the right heart. See? It's not a sin if you don't do it. If we set up a 24-7 house of prayer here, it's going off, and you don't show up, it's not a sin. It's just out of the overflow of love. We've got to get that heart right, okay? Lastly, it's reserved for those who just love Him. Who just love Him. That's the whole motivation. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> okay. How did it come about? This is so cool. I'm going to start with, there's two encounters that go together 
Mm-hmm. And I'm going to start with uh, Jacob's dream. It'll tie into uh, the Tabernacle of David. You'll see. Okay. <clears throat> so in Genesis 28, 10 through 12, you know that Jacob is traveling. He gets stuck on the wrong side of the river. He decides to spend the night. He finds a rock, which is really interesting. Okay? The, the Hebrew tradition, this is fun, the Hebrew tradition is that there were many rocks. And the rocks were fighting over who gets to be under Jacob's head. And so there was a miracle that they all came together into one rock. <laughs> That's a real Jewish tradition, okay? All right. So then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there. Because the sun had set, he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth and its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Wow. And then in that, he also speaks to God and it speaks to Jacob in that dream about his promise to Abraham. Which is now, it's, he's like, Jacob, it's still on. My promises remain true and now they apply to you. And then, it says in, in Genesis 28, 16 through 17, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. I feel like that in some churches, you know. (laughs) That's a joke. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? You have to understand, it's not awesome like the South Bay awesome. Hey, awesome. No, no. Awesome, there's a level of fear to awesome. Awesome is I am really glad I'm here and really scared at the same time. Okay? How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. The house of God. You know what that word is in Hebrew? Bethel. 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 The house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. The gate of heaven. What an encounter. He's in the house of God. And it's the gate of heaven. This is the first mention of the house of God in the Bible. And get this, there's no building there. This is the house of God. (laughs) What makes a house of God? Really, the gate of heaven makes it a house of God. Why is that? Because a gate is a portal to another realm. A gate. If you have a gate in your front yard, that, that if you open that, you can cross over from public, the public sidewalk into your private property. There's any gate. The gate that we have in our property in the back. If you open that up, it, you cross over into something else. This was a gate into heaven that was open right there in that place. How amazing. It was a portal to another realm. Let's just go there now. A portal to another realm. Uh, Sometimes they call it a thin place. Where it's like, it's right there. You know, you're in the physical, but heaven's like right there. You could just touch it. The angels were going in and out. They had found where there was a gate open from heaven to earth. They were going uh, from, hev- from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven, going back and forth. It was a highway, a highway for the angels, a place of encounter. Isn't that amazing? And Jacob, he was sleeping, has this encounter with God, and he's realizing this is an amazing place. I mean, the ladder that he saw was not just an idea that popped in his head. It was a prophetic dream where his eyes were open to see what was going on in the spiritual realm. That's what happened. Amazing, right? All right, we fast forward to 
to David now. <clears throat> so David, it starts in First Chronicles 21. And um, let me tell you the quick version of this. You know that he did the, the census, and the census was not permitted by God in that, in that time. He wanted to, it was kind of a pride thing, right? How many warriors do I have? How many chariots do I have? How many people? Let's see. Let's count them. And it was, he got into pride. And so what happened, it opened the door to the enemy. And the enemy brought just punishment on the nation of Israel because of this king's decision. And there was a plague going on. People were dying left and right. And David's freaking out. And so, um, so then Nathan, uh, there was two prophets that day, Nathan and Gad, I believe it was Nathan that told him, God wants you to go and do a sacrifice over here on uh, this other land up here. So if you know, Jerusalem, the city was walled off, but there was a lower portion and an upper portion. And it was so hard to capture that city. They finally did it by going through the water vent and they captured the city, but they only occupied the lower part. There was still a Jebusite that was occupying the upper part of Jerusalem. So that part had never been touched with bloodshed. It, was, it did not see war up there. It was reserved for a holy place. Pretty cool. Okay. So then David built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And he called to the Lord and he answered him with fire. Fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. So imagine you're trying to do this. Andre and I, one time, we, we, I had a 4x4 truck and we went across country. We were in this place called Ote. Ote, Colorado is the 4x4 capital of the world. And so we're there. It was so humid, we couldn't light our fire. It was so wet in the air. It was so hard. So it reminds me of that. So imagine David trying to light this fire I got to do this burnt offering. The prophet told me to do so. And then all of a sudden from heaven, whoosh, fire just, to, just consumed his offering. Well, what do you do then, right? What do you do when fire comes from heaven and it consumes your burnt offering? So then David said, 1 Chronicles 22.1, the same thing that Jacob said. This is the house of of the Lord God. And this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. He realized that in that place, God was there. And he had this great idea, this is where the tabernacle is going to go. This is where the temple is going to go. And I believe from then on, he worshipped and, and sacrificed right in that place. From then on. And then there was many years from then until Solomon actually built the temple that David was worshiping at Tabernacle of David right there. Okay? So again, this is the house of the Lord, a gate, a passageway from, from one reality to another. A gate placed on the edge of two realities, heaven and earth, a highway where angels are ascending and descending David realizes that this place is special. God is there. He decides to build a house for God in that place. And you guys know the story where he had this huge plans and God said, you can't make that temple because not only did I save that plot of land with no bloodshed, but there has to be a man who builds it that hasn't also seen bloodshed. Your hands have seen war, and you can't build this temple. But he gives David a promise. I promise you, your descendant will. And Solomon was young in those days. So it was decades, decades until that happened. And so David, he got iron from all different places, and he started um, setting up like a whole storehouse of material stones that were cut already, everything for his son Solomon. 
Okay. Let's see. I don't know why I have this verse. First Chronicles 6.49. But Aaron and his sons offered on the altar of burnt offering and on the altar of incense for all the work of the most holy place and to make atonement for Israel according to all that Moses the servant had commanded. Okay. So this was, I get it now, this was under uh, King David's reign and he had everything going on that had to do with the law of Moses. But then he also did something different. He also set up something that was above and beyond. That was a tabernacle of David. Okay? <clears throat> Any questions so far? Okay. First Chronicles 6, 31 through 32. This is where it gets into the physical aspects of the tabernacle of David. What exactly was it? What did it look like? This, these, these two passages right here really um, explain what it is. Now these are those whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark rested there. They ministered with song before the tabernacle of the tent of meeting until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Okay? So right in that place, David set up something that was, wasn't there before. In a part of the Mosaic law and the sacrifices and the atonement and all that, it, it says nothing about the songs. Okay? Now, obviously, the Jewish culture had it built in to their festivals and their parties and even their, their dinners and stuff. They would be sitting around and they would dance and they would sing. Right? But this was a, a cultural thing. David said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to introduce into this place of worship, because worship, remember, worship was not singing. It was not instruments. Okay? Worship was sacrifice. It was obedience and sacrifice. Worship, and if you, and if you know anything about sacrifice, the grain offerings, the animal offerings, all of that was income. They didn't have dollar bills or anything. They didn't, they didn't take their animals and then go sell them, and then take money like we do, and then pay the bills. No, this, is, this was their currency. And so worship in the Old Testament had to do mostly with tithes and offerings. That was worship. Right? And we've gotten away from that. The modern worship movement, if you dig into it, there's so many things that it's not biblical. It shouldn't be called worship. A lot of things. Now, I'm not going to be a stickler and say we have to change this name and all that stuff. But I want, if we're going to reset, if we're going to purify worship, we have to know what it is and what it isn't. Right? And so, a lot of times we, we say, well, I just worshiped for two hours. Did you really? According to who? Because you sang songs to the Lord. But biblically speaking... I'm sure that's worship. And I tell you this because I don't ever want anyone here in this room to go to heaven and God said, hey, what happened? I gave my life to you on the altar every conference. I sang about surrendering my heart every Sunday. But then during the week, you didn't obey. Right? So what is worship? We'll get into that more. We're going to redefine worship. Okay. So he introduced uh, instruments and singing into the tabernacle right in front of the ark. They say, I can't find it in Scripture, okay? But they say, many, many scholars say that the mosaic tabernacle had a thick veil before the, in front of the ark where you couldn't see it. And David's was open. I, I can't find it in Scripture. But I don't know where they're getting this. But that's, that's the word on the street. So, again, this next paragraph is also um, explaining what the tabernacle of David looked like. First Chronicles 16, 4-7. through seven. He appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and praise 
the Lord God of Israel. This is different, very different. Asaph the chief, and you'll see Asaph in a lot of the Psalms written by the, the chief songwriter or singer or whatever. Um, so I think it was, no, music director, his title. And so you'll see some of the Psalms not written by David, but written by Asaph, if you pay attention to right, right before the Psalm starts. Okay, Asaph the chief, and second to him, Zechariah, then J.L., Shemeromoth, Jehiel, Matehiah, Eliab, Benaiah, Obed Edom, and Jael with musical instruments, harps, lyres. Also, Asaph played loud sounding cymbals. Loud. <laughs> and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, blew trumpets continually before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Do you know what the word continual means? <laughs> nonstop. Blew trumpets nonstop. This was a sight, I'm telling you. Before the Ark. Which, that part was, if there was no veil, that was against the law. To do that before the Ark. Only the high priest could go in there once a year, according to uh, Leviticus. <clears throat> okay? Verse 7. Then on that day, David first assigned Asaph and his relatives to give thanks to the Lord. I love that. What was the whole purpose? To give thanks. Wow. There is something so powerful about thanksgiving that God loves. We're going to get into that later on. <clears throat> so this is considered the tabernacle of David. If you want a mental picture, there was uh, instruments, there was singers, there was cymbals, I believe there was dancing, there was uh, uh, trumpets, all ministering to the Lord before the ark 24-7. This is what David set up. He used his resources to honor the Lord. It was the place he wanted to be. It was his home, really. Right there in, in God's presence. That's his favorite place. He wanted to be, you could, you could tell, he wanted to be a priest. When they brought the ark in from Obed-Edom's house, you guys remember Obed-Edom? He had the 10-foot carrots. <clears throat> so they tried to bring the ark right to Jerusalem. And uh, David's friend died because he tried to study the ark and touched it. And it stayed at Obed-Edom's house for a little bit. I, I don't know how long, a few months or something. And it says Obed-Edom's house, everything in it, his family, everything flourished. <laughs> and David was jealous. He's like, we've got to get that ark in Jerusalem. <laughs> and so they did. And when they got it there, on the way there, you could see David's heart. He danced before the Lord, and he danced in a linen ephod, which is, in Leviticus, the prescribed dress code for a priest. And so many people say he danced in his underwear. Not true. Not true. The reason why his wife, Micah, was so embarrassed and got on him was because in order to wear the linen ephod, he had to take off his kingly robe. And a king in those days, to take off their kingly robes, that was undignified. Does that make sense? That's why she was so mad. You're a king. You shouldn't be looking like that. This puts shame on all of us. And he said, I will be even more indignified than this. He had a heart of a priest and a worshiper. He danced with all his might before the ark of the Lord with a linen ephod. It wasn't underwear. It was appropriate for what he was doing. He said, I am going to lay down my title and I'm going to be a worshiper before the Lord. This was David's heart. And that's why God loved his heart so much. He wants to bring this back into the end time revival. Okay? This heart. 
So you guys understand what was going on now? So there was a place in Upper Jerusalem. God, the uh, Holy Fire, came on his sacrifice. He realized God was in this place. He moved the ark up to that place, had plans to make a, a temple. Because he said, how can I live in a house made of, of wood and stone and God's in the tent? And so, but God said, you're not the one to do it. You're going to do it. So, but for decades, until Solomon was old enough to do that, he had the tabernacle of David in that place 24-7, which totally touched God's heart. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> okay. But before you think of it as a formula, because I know us humans like to get into formulas. Okay, let me bullet point that and let me do that so I can please the Lord. God doesn't like formulas. Okay. Remember, God has never been into formulas. It was David's heart that God got caught God's attention, right? It was David's heart that caught his attention. And so this is amazing because David had an idea, had a heart and an idea to bless the Lord. And so some of you may not dance or play an instrument or sing like David, right? Right? But when you have a creative idea as a child of God to want to bless the Lord out of, your, out of the overflow of your heart, right? You've obeyed God. You've said, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do today? There's no outstanding you know, people that are mad at you. You've forgiven everyone. You, you're in this place where you have, you have obeyed the Lord. And now you want to do something above and beyond. Well, you could do any you could do anything with the heart of David. That's what's so amazing. That's why I don't want anyone to get in a formula because it's not necessarily about the music. You understand? It's not necessarily about the actual place, but it was about the heart. What do you what what's your tabernacle, David? What do you want to do? Just out of the the abundance and the overflow of your heart to just minister to the Lord. It could be anything. And as children of God, we're allowed to be creative. Isn't that cool? It's not, or it's not about requirements. The tabernacle of David, the whole idea was not about requirements. And that's what blesses God so much. So, what time is it? How are we doing? 8.40? Oh no, I better hurry up. Okay. I'm going to go turbo mode now. So, New Testament. Now what? He wants to restore the tabernacle of David. And now we're in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. What does that look like? Okay? So the tabernacle was more than a meeting place with the Lord. It was, it was a value system, a heart posture, a system of priority. That's important. It was David's Heart's priority, right? And a passion representing a love for God and His presence. It represents a kind of worship that's pure, not religious, and not a means to an end, but an end of, it, of itself. That was David's reward. That was his inheritance, his home, his happy place to be in God's presence. It wasn't we read the Psalms. It wasn't to win battles or to get richer or to get wisdom. That's just where he wanted to be. And that's the kind of lover that God wants. So the new covenant tabernacle. Now, guess what? We are now called the tabernacle. 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20 Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Uh, sorry, let me start over. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been brought, bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. A lot of times we get this word flesh mixed up with sin. Okay? 
now that we have our new creations, our flesh can be used for good or bad. It's neutral. It's how you use it. Okay? So now, but our flesh houses the, the Spirit of God. We are now the tabernacle, right? And so in the, this changes things because in the Old Testament, his presence was in one place at one time in the world. One gate from heaven to earth, one gate. Because his spirit dwells in us, now we are his resting place. We take him everywhere. It's literally heaven on earth. We are now the gate. We're the gates. We are where heaven touches earth. Isn't that amazing? Where Jacob and David were blown away at a special place the literal house of God, the gate of heaven. Now you are that gateway for the angels, for God's presence, for his healing power. It's amazing. It's totally changed and shifted. You're a walking gate. You release heaven. This is God's plan. This is how he's doing it. You release heaven now. It's amazing. That's how it's completely changed, right? We are the open heaven. Heaven comes through us. You guys believe that? Amen. Okay. Any questions? No questions? Okay, I have, yes. 1 Corinthians, oh, let me see, that's not it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Okay, I have some extracurricular information if we don't have any more questions. <clears throat> okay, remember when I said that David found that spot and created the Tabernacle of David right there on the temple, now is the Temple Mount, right? Now that where they built the temple. In Jerusalem okay so if you go back to Hezekiah who was another another reformer of worship okay it says in 2nd Chronicles 30 14 they arose and removed the altars which were in Jerusalem they also removed all the incense altars and cast them into the brook Kidron so this was not the only verse that tells about how he reformed it and how he tore down the high places and all that stuff. Well, listen to this. Israel got used to having their own altars. Okay? They stopped, especially because of the, uh, ex the exile and all that stuff, the captivity and all that. They got used to, you know, how am I supposed to worship God? How am I supposed to, you know, give a sacrifice, give an offering, whatever? How am I supposed to pray? And they would build altars with these rocks. Okay, and so people had different altars. It's not; it wasn't necessarily idol worship, right? But it was something that wasn't uh, according to Mosaic law. And so when Hezekiah came on the scene, he destroyed every altar where there was an altar for a neighborhood or something, um, kind of like um, Gideon's dad. Everyone would come to his yard to give a sacrifice to the share pole and stuff like that. Well, they had all these altars. So Hezekiah totally wiped out all the altars. Not only wiped them out, threw them into the, the, the brook. Okay? But in 1910, there was a guy who was a, um, not a Christian, not a Jew. He was uh, greedy for treasure. He was a treasure hunter. And so he paid one of the guards on the Temple Mount to go under and start digging. And what he found was a bunch of rooms under there that were, that were hewn out of the rock. A bunch of rooms. And so um, then another guard came, found out what they were doing, and chased them away. And the news at that time said that these guys got away with uh, King Solomon's crown or whatever, but I, I don't think it was true. And but they uncovered something underneath the Temple Mount. 
And so what they found was a place of uh, making anointing oil, a place of sacrifice, a sacrificial place, and a stone altar. And they believe, uh, this, is, this is theory, but they believe that Hezekiah, because of his honor for King David, didn't destroy it, but just buried it. Filled it in with dirt. And they've been uncovering this for years, since 1910. And they found one of those stone altars and all the other things that would take place, all these different rooms, even a special room that could be a place for the ark, um, underneath the Temple Mount, right at the same place where they eventually built the temple. And they think maybe it was King David's Tabernacle of David, which is there now. So I saw a video of a pastor going, and he was, the Jewish guy was showing the pastor all around. He said, well, let me bring you back next year because we're still digging and finding all these things. Isn't that amazing? So they think maybe Hezekiah didn't destroy that one, just buried it. And it's pretty cool for us, right? Anyway, that's extra info. So, clear as mud. Everyone good? So we're going to get more into um, David's heart, um, his, his motives, what he was going after, and redefining worship and redefining prayer. Okay, then it's for this month, right? Yes. The verse in Isaiah that talks about the heads of the gates. Uh, I don't, oh, not that one. I was thinking of the lift up your heads, O ye gates. That's something different, but no, I don't. But oh, that's it? Did you have a comment about that? I, I, think, I think it's prophetic, yeah. She's saying, is that the reference for that we are now gates? And part of the background of that was they had these gates, and um, a lot of the, they had swinging gates, but the top was usually made of stone, right? And when they couldn't get in something in there that was too big, they had to take off the head of the gate to let this thing in to the city. And so it says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let the King of glory come in. He's bigger than the gate you have. <laughs> Psalm 24-7. Oh, Psalm 24-7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Let the King of glory come in. <clears throat> wow. I think it's prophetic. I got chills. <clears throat> okay. Very cool. Let me remind you guys, um, you are all part of an experiment. There's cameras. In, I'm just kidding. No. You are all part of um, my plan to take over the world. <laughs> Um, I feel like if I honestly feel like there may be some one thing that I do in my lifetime and this may be it just to reform worship honestly and um, it's a big deal to me we're going to be starting slowly but I want to I'm developing a core group of people who understand this have a heart for this um, to be running this house of prayer Tabernacle of David and so um, I'm just excited for all you being here. And obviously there's no pressure. Whoever, out of the overflow of their heart, wants to do it, right? <laughs> but um, that's why I'm going after this. And so we're going to do it uh, this class here. And I'm sure eventually I'm going to start sprinkling it into uh, Sundays and everything that we do. But I'm super excited. So this reset. There's a book that I really enjoyed. And it's called The Reset by Jeremy Riddle. And it's not very big, um, but it's a very much a prophetic word. Um, if you can get the audio book, it's so much better. I did both, but he actually reads the audio book. It's his voice, and he, there's a lot of passion in that. So anyway, if you want to dig some more, Jeremy Riddle, R-I-D-D-L-E. Okay? The Reset. Okay, let's pray.
God, we thank you so much for David's example. Um, and we want to continually give you thanks for you who are good. You're so good. And if the truth be known, our hearts do overflow with thanksgiving and love for you. And we want to please you in every way we can. We want to go over the top crazy with ministering to you. We want to spare no expense and just bless your heart. It is our joy and our delight to be close to you, to just be in your very presence. It is the end of our desire. It is not a stepping stone. And we come with just tremendous love um, for you, your presence, your Holy Spirit. And we just, uh, again, thank you for being with us. Thank you for living inside of us. Thank you for your crazy plan of making us now your tabernacle. And we will steward that the best we can. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.